I think we can start now. All right. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, JP. So, magandang umaga po. Uh, we're excited to deliver today a very special uh, webinar. And um, before anything else, so this is about a grail scale approach to reasoning in general chemistry. So looking into chemical bondings in solid. So just for some ground rules. So next slide. So please uh, mute and your um, mic and turn off your video unless you wanted to ask questions later on. And uh, we strongly discourage recording of the session. So we will provide the full video of the event in our Facebook page as well as in our website. Next slide. And yes, so may mga questions na actually sa YouTube uh, chat box. So certificate of participation will be distributed. So we will post a Google form link. So in the Zoom chat box as well as in the uh, message area dun sa YouTube. And this is for the issuance of the certificate of participation. Okay. Uh, if you, for example, decided to just watch the video later, so you can also ask for the certificate of participation. Just make sure to look into the link which is posted in the video description in YouTube. And we strongly advise you to subscribe to our official YouTube channel para updated kayo sa mga happenings ng Field Sci Hub. Next. So right. with this, I'll give you JP to introduce our Philippine, Filipino Science Hub to all of us. All right. So can, can you hear me? Ayan po. So magandang magandang umaga po. Uh, ang ating pong, uh, CEO and founder, Doc Jeff Bunkin, is on vacation today. So I'll be uh, I'll be the one to present to you or introduce uh, our page, our group, the Filipino Science Hub, uh, to our new participants. O yung mga participants po na ngayon lang po natin nakasama. Okay? So uh, PhilSci Hub mission is uh, to promote STEM education and uh, the culture of research uh, among students and teachers in the Philippines. So we are um, a seven-man team. Bakit nawala si Ma'am Dindi dito? So, but uh, we are headed by our founder, Dr. Jeffrey Bunkin. And, uh, oh, there. Uh, with Ma'am Dindi, uh, Marty, myself, Ma'am Daang, and Janice. So you can uh, uh, quickly check into our uh, backgrounds on, on our website. And uh, ayun po, uh, we've been doing uh, uh, webinars and uh, tutorials for the past year already. We just had uh, our anniversary uh, uh, last May 2nd uh, of our group. So ayun po. But uh, this, uh, this group has been in existence since uh, 2012, since uh, Doc Jeff uh, um, formed it as a, as a Facebook group. But uh, we have just been very active during the pandemic period to, to help our teachers and students and uh, support uh, the uh, long-distance learning. Okay. So uh, the Phil Sci Hub uh, Trust is uh, two part uh, these days. So we have uh, the education component, which is uh, Phil Sci Hub Ed, uh, that aims to empower uh, STEM educators and also... Uh, provide uh, learning materials um, uh, dun po sa mga key STEM areas like physics, biology, chemistry, and mathematics. And ayun po, nagpo-provide po kami ng mga modules for learning and um, um, uh, other educational materials para po matulungan yung mga teachers natin. And then uh, we have the uh, uh, application part, which is the Phil Sciha Research University. And I'm um, particularly... Uh, at the helm of this uh, campaign. So in Phil Sci Hub Research University, we, we try to bring the, the STEM practitioners, uh, the actual uh, engineers, um, microbiologists, uh, we bring them closer to the educational sectors, among teachers, among sujante, by um, launching uh, webinars like this. So in fact, uh, today, 
we have um, a special topic for um, Phil I have uh, Ed naman po because this is all about um, chemistry education, general chemistry. And uh, with this, we would, uh, it is in our vision to, to uh, formulate or uh, uh, form a new uh, generation of uh, Pinoy STEM enthusiasts na makapagbuo po tayo ng panibagong uh, STEM culture in the Philippines, which is stronger and at par with our um, ASEAN neighbors, at least para po we, we can keep up with international standards. All right. So the Filipino Science Hub, ito, uh, ito po yung uh, mga numbers namin. We have been in existence for for 12 months at least online and uh, we have uh, we haven't updated this but uh, more than 30 web events already and uh, we have probably more than 40,000 training hours offered already. So you can check our content uh, on our uh, social media handles and also YouTube. Okay, so we have, uh, as I've said, we have one component of uh, uh, the Filipino Science Hub, which is PhilSci Hub Ed. And uh, we try to um, help our teachers as academic uh, frontliners. And right now we are uh, 30,000 strong in the group. And uh, if we, uh, like realize the multiplier effect for for uh, impact. So if you if you multiply our thirty thousand uh, members or teachers with 30, 30 students each on a thirty year career, we we are looking at like twenty seven million um, students impacted by our uh, by our campaigns and our group. And uh, in Philsci Hub Ed. Uh, we have um, online resources for uh, uh, online teaching and also teaching webinars um, so that um, our teachers uh, become more uh, comfortable in delivering lectures online and also um, administering to um, uh, long distance or distance learning. So we have uh, webinars on uh, online teaching and also for uh, um, facilitating uh, assessment or evaluation for students, which is also very important. Ayan po, kindly check. And then we have modules, okay? So if you, uh, if you go to our website, um, you can see there um, a whole bunch of uh, uh, modules which are um, curated by uh, our group of uh, module creators. I am G. Aguila, Ivy Rituya, and Mark Cortes, um, who um, made uh, tailor fit uh, modules for uh, high school and elementary. So, I am po, uh, medyo structured po yung modules because they, they have teaching guides, class activities, and even problem sets with solutions. So, uh, our students can, can practice um, with all of these different topics and also teachers to guide them in uh, in delivering these uh, topics. Okay. And uh, recently we have launched this uh, Phil Sci Hub um, STEM teaching webinar series, uh, which is uh, in partnership with FUSE or the foundation of, of up the, for the upgrading of the standard of education FUSE. This is um, a member of the uh, Tan, uh, Lucia Tan group of companies and uh, another premier university um in education in the philippines so uh there in the in this webinar series we will be um offering um pedagogical training courses as well as uh innovative um or practical stem teaching to to filipino scientists so uh yung pedagogical part will be uh offered by fuse and dun po naman sa part ng phil sci hub is the uh, practical and innovative uh stem so we we try to to bring in actual STEM practitioners to deliver um, lectures and some tips on how to, to really um, make STEM teaching more relatable and uh, more uh, practical in the real world. Ayan. Okay. So ito po yung mga list ng courses for uh, the Phil, uh, FUSE Phil Sci Hub STEM teaching webinar series. So we have 
just finished the the first course last um, last week, and that was about the uh, importance of uh, effective STEM teaching. So kindly check this out, and this we will roll this out uh, from uh, May up until August, and uh, we have there's a possibility for um, CPD issuance for these webinars. So um, if you participate this, pwede po tayong uh, mag-participate uh, live and also uh, offline. So uh, kindly uh, take hold lang po. Kindly secure your your uh, certificates of participation uh, dahil uh, we have the possibility to issue uh, CPD units for these uh, webinars. Uh, inayos lang po yung paperwork. Okay. And also, um, uh, a part of this uh, program is the uh, STEM Teaching Fellowship Program, which is on its pilot run. And uh, right now, we can only accommodate a, a limited number of slots for this. Because apart from the uh, lecture part, which is the webinar series, uh, we will also have a workshop on um, STEM teaching. And... Uh, Dun po ang ang aim namin is to teach our uh, teach our teachers uh, the innovative and practical approach to STEM teaching and also uh, experience mentorship from Fuse and uh, uh, the the partner university and from us and we'll also try to foster collaboration among uh, educators and the uh, ang output po nito is. Uh, uh, the educational materials, which is the uh, the uh, online or, or the module uh, that will be shared on a national platform. So right now we can only accommodate twenty. So major rigorous po yung uh, um, selection for this uh, pilot run of the fellowship program. But uh, hopefully next year we can go um, we can upscale this and uh, try to accommodate more teachers who are interested. All right. So uh, another component of the uh, uh, Phil Sihab Trust these days is the Phil Sihab Research University, uh, which is a webinar series focusing on uh, scientific research and all of it and all of its different aspects. So here we try to uh, um, put in uh, the best practices for any research endeavor and try to uh, share our own uh, our own research experiences um, to. To, to guide our students in, in, in carrying out their research project. And uh, ayun po, uh, we started this uh, campaign last year, September, and we're now on to our seventh um, topic, which is thesis writing, uh, which will be delivered by uh, Professor Mejo and Aguila in June. Okay, so eight mandatory courses po ito, starting from research ideation all the way up to um, poster and conference presentation. And ayun po, uh, you can also participate this uh, this uh, series online or live and also uh, offline or asynchronous. So uh, lahat po ng mga courses namin ay naka, naka post po sa, sa website namin. You can just try to, to go there and uh, watch the, the video recording and also uh, check the link on the video description for the uh, certificate of participation and um, yung mechanics po nung uh, pag -de deliver naman because if you complete uh, the eight mandatory courses you will get a completion certificate and the way we uh, uh, the way we mechanize that is through uh, Google Classroom and all of the uh, the mechanics are summarized in our uh, info webinar uh, on this uh, video. Ayan, paki, paki check na lang po and I will also uh, send this uh, later via email. Okay. So, Philsci Hub is always present in, in all of its platforms. We have uh, our main handle, which is uh, the, the, the website at www.philsci-hub.com. And uh, we're also ever present on Facebook, uh, YouTube. All of our videos are in YouTube and also even in, on TikTok where we have uh, short clippings of uh, science. Ayan. So dun po sa website namin, we have webinars, tutorials, module, modules, virtual labs, and other special features. So kindly check it out. And uh, ayun po, 
all of our uh, we can, I just want to make note that uh, all of our ob offerings are are absolutely free. So this is our offering for all of our teachers and students and uh, hindi po kami nagpapabayad. So uh, we just uh, want your sincere participation in all of our our programs and webinars. So sana po uh, ma, ma maintain and ma sustain po namin. All right. So today uh, we have uh, another uh, lecture and uh, Ma'am Daang will uh, take it from here and introduce our speaker. All right, thank you, JP. Thank you. For our webinar today, so we will have a television chemistry educator. So in fact, uh, he is one of my professors way back in my undergrad years. So JP, can you proceed to the next slide? Then. So, Professor Raymond Monterey, or Sir Monty, or Sir Monmon, Mon, as we call him back in the days. So, he has been an instructor in the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. So, that's where we met. So, he is actually a chemical engineer during his undergraduate years, but he took a Master of Science in Chemistry. So, from being an instructor, he also did some work as magazine editor of Bato Balani. So familiar tayo doon, especially sa high school. I think isa to sa mga binabasa nating mga magazines. And he was a senior trainer for eWorld International University for Continuing Education. Uh, he has been the director for learning environments and innovations in Malayan Colleges, Laguna. And currently, he is an AP chemistry teacher in Saudi Aramco, which is a college preparatory center. So, Sir Monterey is a uh, madami na siyang mga courses na na-handle and we are quite fortunate for today na he will going to share his insights about chemical bonding. Diba? Yung concept ng chemical bonding, medyo mahirap talaga siyang ipaunawa sa mga students and Professor Monterey will give us some tips on how we can do this in class. So, uh, Sir Monmon, so the uh, virtual floor is yours. Good morning to everybody. Good afternoon to some of you. And probably, I'm not sure, some of our participants are coming from somewhere else. Um, I'm very fortunate to have this opportunity to uh, share something with you, especially to our educators. I was told by our organizers that our audience for this webinar is a mix of teachers and students. So I would like to try and see how will I be able to manage the presentation in such a way that it will also be benefiting uh, uh, this particular spectrum of audience. I would like to thank the uh, fields I have for inviting me over. Um, a lot of them are actually my former students. And I'm glad that uh, they've been doing this kind of endeavor to help the Philippines, especially our science and math teachers, uh, to be able to come up with you know, uh, future professionals, especially in the field of science. Um, my topic here will be very short. I know that this is um, very wide in terms of topics. And I chose this topic because um, it gives me a lot of insights as to how my students think. And this is a good opportunity for a teacher to somehow help them think better, especially for those who are uh, preparing for a scientific career. Okay, so for the teachers among us here, uh, this particular topic goes into the discussion about ionic solids and you can go into molecular solids and then you go to metallic bonding later on, but I would like to focus on differences. Now, just to manage our expectation, this is how I normally look into chemistry. When students come into my class, um, they would have this notion about chemistry and if they already have a certain level of science background, say for example, they're also or they have taken physics. 
so to speak, in mathematics. Um, people would always have this notion that how come we do a lot of uh, rules in chemistry and we keep on violating them. So I would like to normally tell my students that actually the interesting part in chemistry would be the gray areas because this is where you get to really apply the higher order thinking skills and then be able to elucidate what happens in between. Okay, so let me share you my presentation. Just, where is that? Okay. So I entitled this grayscale approach to reasoning in general chemistry. For the lack of a better word, I'm always fascinated with the word spectrum. Okay, I don't always treat everything in black or white. And this is an approach that I always tell my students. Okay, of course, it is always good for us to be able to come up with um, pattern recognition, being able to tell black from white, but as a chemistry major, you, it's the good thing about it is that you should be able to explain why this part is gray. Why is it not white? Why is it not black? Okay, and we see a lot of those when we're dealing with chemistry concepts. Okay, so let me just uh, say, for example, if I give you a table like this one here. So in a class discussion, I would show this part of a table. This is actually a long table that somehow would like to explore the relationship of these halides with metals and nonmetals, or the, the metal halides and the nonmetal halides, particularly on the third period. Okay, so when we look at sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine as part of the bonding part in there. So let's look at these four sets. I have sodium fluoride, sodium chloride, you have sulfur hexafluoride and sodium dichloride. We will see that the melting points are starkly different. And if I pose a question, okay, to my students and we say, why do the chloride and fluoride compounds of sodium have significantly higher melting points than their sulfur counterparts? So this is the first question that I would ask them. Of course, at this level of uh, discussion, they already have a background about what covalent compounds are and what ionic compounds are. And we are now exploring uh, the chemical bonding of solids. So normally, if you look into the curriculum, this is uh, midway, the one-year course for chemistry. So in the university, this might be already taken up at the second semester. Okay, second part of a general chemistry course, or if you're teaching in high school, it, that would be midway. Okay, so this is a good opportunity to look into some anomalies and deviations, which is actually what I would like to address when we look into this. So a sample response of the student would be something like the compounds formed by sodium with fluorine and chlorine are ionic compounds, while the compounds formed by sulfur with these two atoms are covalent compounds. So that is a very basic black and white identification of the properties, because if we can delineate or identify the difference between an ionic compound and a covalent compound, that's already a good indication, okay? So you go, that is an opportunity for you to go back and refresh, okay, what did you, uh, what type of basis or what basic basis did you make so that you can say that this was ionic and this was covalent. Okay, so when we look into that, so naturally I'm more onto the log log logical reasoning part, meaning I would like to dig deeper and see how a student would explain such an observation because this becomes a real problem when, we, when you are marking labor laboratory reports. Uh, one struggle our student will be able to uh, face would be interpreting their own results, right? So if their results are not coinciding with existing theories, it's interesting how are they going to, you know, uh, explain 
the outcome. So we have already said that the stark difference between covalent and ionic. So this is coming from the view of an idealized situation that you can easily spot an ionic compound from a covalent compound by simply applying this notion that, oh, okay, if I have a metal and I pair it with a nonmetal, I end up with an ionic compound. And if I have a nonmetal and another nonmetal or semi-metal for that purpose, it will come out to be a covalent compound. So that's a black and white approach into it because that's a generalization that we can normally use. Now, aside from that, you will be looking into now the properties and you would say that ionic solids have characteristically high melting points than covalent molecular solids. And then if a student would uh, answer this and then you keep on asking why, okay? And then you go deeper and say, uh, the force of attraction being broken ionic solids is the electrostatic attraction between cations and anions. So here, you would be able to look into, okay, recognition of what holds the particles together. Okay, so this will uh, tell you the difference between covalent and ionic bonding. So you would say that in molecular solids, only intermolecular forces are broken and no covalent bonds are broken. So that means when you have reached this part of the discussion, I am assuming that you have already addressed the gray area between what intermolecular forces are or interunit forces to make it more or make it wider in scope as compared to an actual chemical bond. Actually here in this particular part, this is where metallic bonding will be introduced and how does that change the view of a student in terms of his uh, notion of what a covalent bond is and what an ionic bond would be. Okay, so of course in the end, students will be saying that intermolecular forces are far weaker than an actual chemical bond. So when we look into that, you say, okay, sodium fluoride and sodium chloride with the, their melting points, 997 and 800, 801, is very, very high compared to the negative melting points of these two covalent compounds. Why? Because when you melt an ionic compound, you are actually breaking the lattice energy, so to speak. So this is the existing electrostatic attraction between the cation and the anion. So that's a large force that you need to break and you need energy for that. While in SF6 and SCL2, what you are breaking are the interunit forces or interpart particle in terms of molecules. We call them intermolecular forces. And by here, the students who have already identified if it's a uh, dispersion force that they are breaking, or is it a dipole-dipole force of interaction, or maybe even H bonding. Now, that's another gray area some, that some student would be able to, you know, be confused with. A lot of students might be thinking H bond is an actual chemical bond when, when and really it's not, it's just an interunit force. It might be very strong, but still it's 10 times weaker than a regular chemical bond. Okay, so that's one gear area that has been addressed supposedly before you reach this particular topic. Okay, so when we proceed, so we go back and refresh our memory. What is a chemical bond? A chemical bond is formed because of the tendency of atoms to find a more stable state. So in the previous discussion, you would know how come hydrogen exists as a diatomic molecule, nitrogen, oxygen. So you have seven of these elemental forms in diatomic form. How come they don't exist as a single atom? Because these are the tendencies of some atoms they would like to look for these uh, lower energy state, okay? So say for example, we would like to look into how come a hydrogen uh, molecule is formed. It's because of this uh, lower state um, achievement. Now, normally when you introduce this to your class in the beginning of chemistry, we just say that stability, lower energy, but of course, when you progress into your study of chemistry, this is very much supported by the loss of thermodynamics. 
okay? So normally you will look, you look into other stuff like energy minimization. And then you will always connect that to an opportunity for them to look into a future topic like Gibbs energy concept. Okay, so all of these will be tied in into future concepts. So a chemical bond is a force of interruption that holds atoms together that allows them to function as a unit. Now, in my introduction in this part, I would always use the phrase force of interruption because some others would only focus on the attractive force. But when you're looking into the structure of the atom and the molecule, you are forgetting that there are repulsive forces occurring there. And this is the sweet spot that the force of attraction overcomes the repulsive forces. Remember, when we look at the structure of the atom, the atom is composed of a positive nucleus. And then of course you have the electrons around it. So when their orbitals overlap, okay? So there will be an element of repulsion, but that because you have a uh, two sets of nuclei, Okay, this stabilizes the electron. So a covalent bond is formed because it leads into the sharing of these uh, pairs of electrons between these atoms. And in, initially, you would be saying that, okay, if one atom and another atom has similar electronegativities, they would normally form a covalent bond. Okay, so um, the best simplification that we can look into that is, of course, the tendency of atoms to conform with the behavior of the noble gases. So remember, in our background, before leading, uh, before coming up with this topic, you have already discussed the electronic structure of the atom, okay? And you will be able to look into how come this happens when these atoms meet with that, and you would know that metals are cation formers, they would normally donate electrons while uh, non-metals would normally take up a few of the electrons so that they can conform with the structure of the noble gases. So with that, uh, it would be a more, you know, optimum for them to just share a pair of electrons to achieve this stability. Okay, so you would say that the shared pair of electrons are attracted to the nuclei of the atoms. And then we go back, what is electronegativity? Does to refresh our memory. This is a measure of the tendency of an atom to attract a bonding pair of electrons. Remember, uh, this is another loophole when you're teaching chemistry, because once the, student are, uh, the students are talking about structure and compounds, sometimes when, in, when they're reasoning, they throw in electronegativity haphazardly, okay? They should have a good grounding what electronegativity is. First, it has to be in a bonding state, okay? So when you're talking about trends, like the size of the atom, okay, or the ionization energy, uh, the trend in electronegativity negativity comes in when it comes to uh, uh, bonding. Okay, so some students will find this particular plot here intimidating, but you can always simply say that this is just talking about the energy state. What we're trying to do is to look into that state or the sweet spot where the attractive forces and the repulsive forces are balanced and we minimize that. In chemistry, when we say energy on the molecular level, we can go down to the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And in chemistry, potential energy is practically talking about distance, okay? Distance between particles. So. For some people who have a physics background, they would normally identify the uh, potential energy like from a high position to a low position. So you can drop a ball and say, okay, there's a difference in potential energy. But when you look at molecules, they are moving, right? In all directions in three-dimensional space. So whatever distance an atom have in this orientation would confer a certain level of potential energy. So you put them, farther away, you put them closer, you change the potential energy. And this will be important when you discuss uh, the concept of cooling and heating, okay? When you look into the molecular level. Anyways, now ionic bonding, however, these are when electrons are perceived to be transferred between atoms with large difference in electronegativity, the resulting ions are held together by 
what are known as electrostatic forces or columbic forces, which is just the balance between this positive and negative uh, attraction. So we can view this as a transfer of electrons and thereby an electron is transferred to another atom, we form ions, the cut ions and the anions. And this is actually where Coulomb's law becomes important in the discussion of bonding, especially in ionic compounds. So Coulomb's law is uh, a fundamental law that we've been always using, even if we are not science majors, we might have heard something like that, right? When you say opposites attract, right? And then those with different charges repel, okay? So we can view this in terms of the force of interaction or the uh, energy of interaction. So when we look into this one here, let's say we have two cut ions, they have the same charges. So their interaction is a function of the magnitude of charge that they carry. Like we're talking about sodium here. Sodium has a plus one magnitude, okay? And if it's bonding with fluoride, fluoride has a minus one. So a plus and a minus will attract each other according to Coulomb's law. And this attraction, the force of attraction is dependent on number one magnitude and how close or how far they are. So you see there, the small r is the internuclear distance. So if we interpret Coulomb's law simply, the force of attraction, the F you see there in the formula, is directly proportional to the magnitude of charge. So that means the higher the valency of the cation, and of course the negativity or the negative charge of the anion, then this attraction becomes stronger. And also corollary to that is that if they are far away from each other, the attraction is lower. But of course, the moment they come closer and closer, this attraction becomes stronger. So that is uh, very much uh, important in the discussion of how ionic bonding is actually explained. So again, attractive repulsive force dependent on the charges in the proximity of these charged particles that we are talking about. Now we go back to table and then we were trying to interpret that and say, okay, now let's try comparing the sodium salts. Okay, is there a gray area here? Is it consistent with the prediction of Coulomb's law? And a student would say the melting point difference is consistent with Coulomb's law. Now, and you would say, why is it based on magnitude of charge or the ionic sizes? So when you compare sodium fluoride and sodium chloride, the commonality is that they are both sodium salts. So the difference is what in their anion, the fluoride and the chloride. So if you look into Coulomb's law, which one is important? They are both a plus one and a minus one combination of salts. So their numerator, the Q values are the same, but the size of the ions will now become important. So a student who has identified Coulomb's law as a good way of explaining ionic bonding so it, he would say that it is expected for sodium chloride to have a higher melting point than sodium chloride because of the size difference. Okay, so let's recall, there's the trend of sizes in terms of atoms and ionic sizes. So, so as you go down the group, the atom becomes bigger and the ion becomes bigger as well. If you're talking about the cut ion, of course a cut ion is smaller than its parent atom and it will it is also discussed in terms of Coulomb's law. Either you're talking about the effective nuclear charge and the outermost electrons, including the shielding or the orbital at which the electron is placed. So all of these have already been discussed in the structure of the atom and you should be able to uh, recall into that. So here, if we compare uh, the position of chlorine and fluorine. Chlorine is at uh, the bottom of fluorine, so that suggests the chloride ion is bigger than the fluoride ion. So since the chloride ion is bigger than the fluoride ion, its internuclear distance with the sodium will be wider, okay? So generally they will be farther apart and the distance is inversely proportional to the force of attraction. So the force of attraction between the ions of the salt is inversely proportional to the size according to Coulomb's law. So here, now we have made sense why sodium chloride is having a lower melting point than sodium fluoride. Okay, so this is consistent with Coulomb's law. So there's no gray area there so far. Now, what if we throw in magnesium chloride in the bunch? Okay, 
So magnesium fluoride will now be pitted against sodium fluoride so that you would know, okay, the difference now would be the cation, okay? So again, when the student sees magnesium and fluorine, I'll come up with an ionic compound, okay? So what's the difference between um, the ions of magnesium fluoride with that of sodium fluoride? Now, then I will have a follow-up question like, will the melting point of magnesium fluoride be lower or higher than sodium fluoride. So what's the basis? Again, you go back to say, let's look into Coulomb's law and then let's compare now the fluoride salts, okay? So now the difference, the point of difference would be the metal that is bonded to fluorine. Okay, so a common response of student would say magnesium fluoride is expected to have a higher melting point than sodium fluoride because of the higher magnitude of charges. So magnesium now carries a plus two charge while sodium will have a plus one charge. So they both have fluorine. So the interaction between magnesium and fluorine will be stronger because of the numerator of Coulomb's law. So therefore we expect that the melting point of magnesium fluoride will be higher than 997. Okay. So melting point difference is still consistent with Coulomb's law. The magnitude of charges will be the basis. And this is because of direct proportionality with the force of the traction, okay? So again, when we look into Coulomb's law, the force is directly proportional to the magnitude of the charge. So we say magnesium fluoride has a higher melting point than sodium fluoride because the force of attraction between the ions is stronger due to higher magnitude of charges carried by the ions, okay? So far so good when you look into that and then you will say, okay, actually the melting point of magnesium fluoride is 1,396. Okay, so that's consistent with our prediction. Now, the question would be, will the melting point trend continue with magnesium chloride being considered? Okay, now we have pitted sodium fluoride against sodium chloride that's consistent with Coulomb's law and sodium fluoride and magnesium fluoride. And we said that's still consistent with Coulomb's law. Okay, so we throw in magnesium chloride. So what if now I present to you that the melting point of magnesium chloride is 708? Okay, if you look into the trend between sodium fluoride and sodium chloride, there was a decrease in the melting point. Yes, yeah? so you can parallel that with magnesium fluoride and magnesium chloride. There was also a decrease, a stark decrease from 1396 to 708. But if you compare horizontally, remember that sodium magnesium is in the same period going to the right. So there was an increase and we have explained that. But when you look into sodium chloride and magnesium chloride, again, going from sodium to magnesium, what we were expecting was actually an increase in melting point. And that's a gray area, okay? So this becomes interesting. So when we look into that, the first question that we might be asking is Coulomb's law, okay, still effective in saying how the behavior of magnesium chloride and its property, particularly the melting point and the student might be, what's happening here, okay? So now when we look into the comparison of chloride salt, the data is not consistent with Coulomb's law now. So that's a gray area. So that's an opportunity for us to peel another layer, okay? And explore other possibilities. Now there's a difference when the question says, is it consistent with Coulomb's law? Because that is recognizing if the student is able to understand what Coulomb's law is saying and then apply that to the data and interpret the data according to the existing theory, okay? Now, this is an opportunity for you to go back and say, and bonding concept is actually not black and white, okay? So you reiterate the term, this is actually a spectrum. Actually, before coming to this particular topic, we should have already introduced that concept that there is no such thing as 100% ionic bond, okay? And students will be thinking, okay, what does that mean? Okay, so you will throw in and say the covalent character of the magnesium chlorine bond is entertained and explored. Okay, so if we are looking at it like they are mutually exclusive, okay? An ionic bond is of course totally different from a covalent 
bind when we look into the properties of substances. We have seen that in our original table. Very high melting points for ionic compounds, very low melting points for molecular compounds. Okay, now let's go back. This is actually discussed by Linus Pauling. So he introduced the concept of electronegativity and the electronegativity decreases from uh, top to bottom and increasing from left to right. And metals have characteristically low, thus we also use the term electropositive in some cases. And then this is a measure of the tendency of an atom to attract a bonding pair of electrons. So now you go back and discuss what type of chemical bond is formed by the basis of electronegativity difference. So now we would like to put some metrics into it so that we can have a sense out of what we're doing. So normally based on this scale, if the electronegativity difference between the atoms bonded is between zero and 0 0.4, we classify that as a nonpolar covalent bond. Covalent bonding ensues, but it's nonpolar, meaning there's no separation of charges or, or so far that we were talking about. So normally a lot of times you will be saying that a carbon hydrogen bond is considered to be nonpolar because of the difference in their electronegativity is very small. Okay, so it's around 0.4, it's in the fence. Now, if the difference in the electronegativity of the bonded atoms is between 0.4 and 1.6, that is a polar covalent bond, okay? That is where uh, your dispersion forces and discussion about the dipole-dipole force differences will come in. And if the difference is greater than 2.0, then most likely what we create is an ionic bond. And this is of course happening between a metal and a metal because a metal ha metals have very low electronegativity. Now, how about those that fall between 1.6 and 2, right? So that's a gray area. And if you're teaching general chemistry, we can just simply simplify that and say between 1.6 and 2.0, an ionic bond is formed if a metal is involved, okay? Otherwise, it's a polar covalent bond. So this is one way of looking into the whole spectrum of bonding, okay? So in other words, if an atom is bonded to another atom, there's a possibility of, you know, a mix of this type of bond. So there's always an ionic character and a bond character into an actual chemical bond at this point. That is uh, the purpose of introducing this. Now, of course, it will not be enough to, you know, account for the physical significance. So when do we say it's practically ionic? So we might be asking, how do we know if it's an ionic compound? So we have to do a litmus test. So a very basic question, if, if I put that in water, for example, if I have a solid and I put that in water, if it forms ions, so that is characteristically an ionic compound, right? So a molecular solid will not normally form an ion in solution. So here even Linus Pauling introduced the concept of the percent ionic character and the minimum requirement is that if a compound has a calculated percent ionic character of at least 50%, then most likely it will behave like an ionic compound. So you will see the red salts that you see on top in there, 50% and above. So when you look particularly into lithium iodide, for example, if you see there with an electronegativity difference of around 1.5, the electronegativity difference is very small. So it will be characterized as a polar covalent bond, okay? Uh, in the first look in terms of electronegativity, but if we do not throw in there the percent ionic character, we'll not be able to uh, justify the physical significance that when you put lithium iodide solid in water, it forms ions, okay? So that's the gray area that we're talking about. So we are now using two things in characterizing a bond, electronegative difference and percent ionic character. So again, when we say what the, the time that you're looking at a bond, you might be thinking, you have to be open to the idea that the chemical bond that you're dealing, dealing with has a mix of ionic and covalent character. And of course, depending on the type of atoms that are bonding, you will be seeing which one is forming uh, most likely an ionic bond or a covalent bond. So when we look into the orbitals, when they overlap, okay? So when we say overlap, 
in the future, depending on what type of curriculum you are actually following. In the very least, you will be using the valence bond theory or the localized model. It's the basis of the Lewis structure that we draw, okay? But it is always uh, noteworthy when we mention it to our students, or if you're looking into that, is to open your mind and say that uh, there is no such thing as one a uh, unified theory that you can actually use to explain chemical bonding, right? If you are open to that idea that gray areas exist and there are other theories that would help. Say, for example, if you're dealing with organic molecules, the valence bond theory would be very much acceptable, except we extend that to the concept of hybridization and also the delocalization of electrons, right? But for a lot of inorganic molecules, you will need the molecular orbital theory to understand their behavior better, right? So that's why you should always, even if we are teaching general chemistry, we should always be connecting that to a higher chemistry course in the future. So if you have a student or if you are advanced in terms of your reading, right? And you will be asking this question to your teacher, you should be able to connect that, okay, this will be dealt with deeply when you get to this particular course. Okay, and my students right now, they are somehow intimidated by saying, oh, you're a chemistry major, you might probably be taking three physical chemistry courses in the university, and you might be taking three organic chemistry courses in the university, and you were not even talking about the laboratories yet, see, and they will be amazed by saying, this particular topic that we're discussing is just a small segment of an advanced inorganic chemistry course, okay, so we are preparing them for future topics that we are already planting the seed that this will grow deeper when they have more theories considered. So now we will be expanding this. Normally, I don't discuss this in general chemistry, but this is an opportunity for some of your students to pick into a more advanced topic. Now, let's face it. If you are teaching a course statistically, 5% of your class would have advanced students, okay? So say, for example, if you're teaching a, a class with a 20, well, that's an ideal class, right? Probably not in the Philippines. 20 students, there's one single smart aleck in there that would really be thinking ahead and say, how come, right? If there's a difference in that. So here we introduce uh, the Fajans rule. Okay, this is dealt with uh, in higher chemistry, in inorganic chemistry. Now, the ability of a cation to distort an anion is known as its polarization power. Okay, so at this point, the, the student already has an idea what polarization is because you have already discussed intermolecular force, right? The dispersion force is actually the distortion of this electron cloud. Okay, so if we change the, the cation at which it is interacting with a particular anion, the higher the charge density of the cation, the greater is its polarizing power. If the anion is small, okay, and the cation is small and packed with charge, polarization is very small. So Fajan's rule is actually having three general things. One is the uh, characteristic of the cation, and the other one is the characteristic of the anion, okay? So the tendency of the anion to become polarized by the cation is known as its polarizability. If, and if you go back and backtrack a little, polarizability is, of course, dependent on the electron cloud. The larger the electron cloud, the higher possibility of polarization. So if your anion is big, like iodide, okay, or bromide, so there's a high possibility of polarizability if you are pairing it with a cation. And then if your cation is bearing a large charge density, like aluminum, for example, has a plus three charge, what happens is that it will, you know, attract the outermost electron of the anion because it's farther away from the nucleus and then polarization happens. And then when that happens, you will create a higher covalent character of the bond, right? Instead of identifying that the electron was really uh, transferred in that case. So look at the electron cloud here in the presentation here. So again, that is Fajan's row. So how do we make sense of that in the existing data that we have, okay? 
look at the ionic characteristic and the covalent characteristic. If the cation is large, okay, that means what? It has a low charge density. So if you have a small anion, small charge, it has become uh, more ionic in character. So this is on top of what we normally view in terms of the electronegativity of Linus Pauling. So the covalent characteristic will manifest more if you have a small cation, okay, with a large anion and the charge is large. So when we go back and look at magnesium chloride, in terms of Coulomb's law, if you are comparing the magnesium salts, meaning magnesium fluoride against magnesium chloride, there will still be a little consistency in that. And you will argue that they have the same plus two charge. And then the, again, the chloride ion is bigger, that makes the melting point lower. Okay, that's fine when you're comparing magnesium fluoride and magnesium chloride, the magnesium salts. But horizontally, sodium chloride and magnesium chloride, that will not be consistent with Coulomb's law anymore. And that would help when it comes to recognizing that there was an increased magnesium chloride uh, covalent bond character that diminishes its melting point. Okay, so if the student can pick that, say, okay, we can put the characteristic of high melting point to ionic compounds or ionic solids. And then on the other extreme is that uh, covalent compounds would have low melting points, ionic compounds, high melting points. So here, the decrease in the melting point of magnesium chloride is because of the increased covalent character. So that would be enough on the general chemistry level, right? So recognizing that the bond has an increased covalent character, it's veering away from a particular ionic character, then that makes sense. And of course, you would say that, okay, uh, in the future, you will deal with that a little bit later. So actually, this is where uh, I become very envious when I was an undergraduate because I was a chemical engineering major, right? And my classmates are doing a lot of organic chemistry stuff and they have an advanced in organic chemistry while I rely on my own reading. That's why I took my master's in chemistry and not in chemical engineering because I would like to go deeper into inorganic as well as organic. Because in chemical engineering, physical chemistry is fine, but organic chemistry that's very small and inorganic is very, very small. And uh, sometimes my teachers are exasperated at my questions because at our level, I would keep on asking this and this, and they would say, why don't you shift to the chemistry program? And I'm getting frustrated because I was not allowed to do that. So I keep on asking that. So we should be ready with students like those, right? They are really ready and then expand their horizon. But of course, we should also tell them that this is good for now if we recognize that this would be good enough for us. In looking forward, you will be looking into some other things that could explain this particular property. Now, one thing that I advocate about data is the physical significance, okay? What do the physical properties tell you? And then connect that with the existing theory. Now, this is a good uh, way of thinking for future scientists, okay? Now, if we have recognized that there is an increased covalent character as you go from left to right, say sodium, magnesium, now it will be easier for them to accept that when we look at aluminum fluoride, it will have now a lower melting point compared to magnesium fluoride because of increased uh, covalent character. And then you go back, okay, oh, the electronegativity difference is very small. Okay, that would be fine. So that's why 1,040 seems justifiable. And then when you look at aluminum chloride, whoa, from 708 down to 190, that's a big drop. Well, because you will drop the bomb that say aluminum chloride actually is a covalent compound, right? With high melting point relatively. Because you have now recognized that, okay, the bonding is actually, you know, a little flexible. That's the word spectrum. Right, it's not black and white, it's always falling into the gray area. So what's the litmus test? If you have ways of putting aluminum fluoride, aluminum fluoride will most likely be dissolving with ions forming, but aluminum fluoride will not. So when you go back, you go deeper and deeper. So say for example, when you start discussing Lewis structure, 
and students will be amazed and say, beryllium is a metal, chlorine is a nonmetal. I will be drawing the structure of an ionic compound and then say, no, beryllium chloride is actually a covalent compound. And then we say, oh, what's the basic electronegativity difference? So you go back. So I'm always advocating this type of approach, which is spiral. You introduce a concept, sometimes black and white, and then you go deeper and deeper, peel the layers and see the gray areas and say, oh, there are the differences, okay? And this is good for scientific thinking, okay? So when you look at the bigger picture here, there will be, you will be seeing a lot of anomalies and actually you will need more hours for discussion and I will not be going into that. My point here is that when you look at the data, number one, the student should be able to compare the data with the existing theories, okay? What does a particular theory say about this? And then if it's not consistent, that's the time that you consider other theories that might be applicable. If you are a researcher, you are doing that all the time. And they should have appreciated that kind of thinking when you have discussed the atomic theory, the historical perspective. It might be boring to a lot of students, but if these are science majors, they would really identify how come from say, the Thomson's model, it has grown to the, to Rutherford's model and then later on to, into Bohr's model and into the quantum mechanical model that we have right now, okay? It's because of these gray areas that they see every time that they test the physical significance and compare that with existing theories, okay? So if you keep on doing that now with the kind of thinking that the students have, even when you throw in metallic bonding in there, we will, they will be considering also the overlap between a covalent bond and a metallic bond and an ionic bond with a metallic bond. Because the moment you introduce metallic bonding in solids, how is that different from a covalent bond? Remember classically, when you think about covalent bonding, the electrons are shared. Well, in a metallic bonding, sort of, it's similar, but the sharing is between the same atoms, right? But in an ionic compound, it's the electrostatic attraction between the anion and the cation that is important. In metallic bonding, there's a similarity in there because that is the electrostatic attraction made by the cation and they're the localized electrons. So that's the reason why metals have variable melting points, right? There are metals with very low melting points. There are metals with very high melting points. And then you can grow into discussing the covalent network, the fourth type of solid that the student might be able to see in this particular chapter. So my point is when you're looking at a concept, yes, it is always good to look into pattern recognition, which is white, which is black, but we should always be ready into uh, identifying the gray areas and trying to figure that out. Now, my personal insights as a teacher in chemistry especially in this particular topic is I keep on doing the spiral way of introducing and teaching concepts, always going back to what they know, connecting that with the new topics that we are looking into, what has changed, what has been added, what can we actually glean from all of this. And the grayscale approach is treating everything as, as a spectrum. It's like when we were in UP, we would always say, yes, no, it's dependent, we would say because we don't know what type of boundaries the condition are actually subject to. So you would know, it's not always a yes, it's not always a no, right? And a phrase that the students will always catch me when they're asking a question is maybe, right? Because they have to explore it a little bit. And of course, as a teacher, this is an opportunity for me to do instruction differentiation, right? So for the, teachers with a good education background. This is an opportunity for you to say, okay, if I am teaching a heterogeneous class, right? The objective is to teach the standard at the minimum, but there will always be students who are lagging behind and there are students who are more advanced than the others. So when we stratify our approach, we are always looking into these kinds of students in your class. That is normally why a teacher would agree with me that normally what you would remember would be makukulit, matatalino, yung medyo mambagal, right? 
But the average students, they are part of a statistics, right? Because they are part of the group. And normally what we are after into disseminating all the information that we have. Okay, so I hope we get to know um, my point at this point. And this is a post that I made in Facebook more than a year ago. This is how fascinated I am with such. And I quote, I have always been fascinated with gray areas. That's why I'm a stickler for looking at almost everything as a spectrum. I may even be treating life like one. Approach with recognizing the black and white extremes, but with a little bit more focus on the overlaps and the repercussions of these overlaps. Yes, with all the underpinnings and undertones. That's what makes chemistry interesting to me compared to the other fields of sciences. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Monty. So we've had taken a chance to look into different way of uh, different approach kung paano natin ituturo in general yung chemistry, no? So looking into it uh, as a spectrum. So actually, there are some comments that we receive. I will just like to highlight some. So according to Kaloy, he really liked that the presentation and the illustration that you have, they are very good. And he liked the concept as well of spectrum of bonding. And uh, in YouTube, uh, Clint Irvin Mosqueda uh, mentioned that the talk is actually very informative. And they gave a lot of uh, thank you for the topic that you presented. Actually, in YouTube, I think there's also uh, Mosaic Learning um, from India who chimed in and log in and watch your presentation. So, sir, may you. questions lang dito. So, from okay. Zoom, Michael Galario, can we okay. generalize? So. Can we generalize that mostly atoms would want eight electrons in its outermost orbital? This is the octet rule. So, sir, medyo siguro elaborate natin yung octet rule. Ano yeah. ba yung so, so, normally, when we introduce this to our students to bonding, yes, there's the normal tendency of the atoms to conform with the noble gas configuration, right? Because noble gases are technically inert, right? They would normally not form compounds. And this is anchored on the stability. Of course, it will be explained a little bit more when you go into thermodynamics and you go Gibbs energy. But it, in the beginning, that would be a good generalization, okay? At your benchmark of discussion is that, okay, the tendency of the atom is to complete its octet. But of course, that's also a lot of gray areas when it comes to bigger molecules, it will be consistent with most binary compounds, meaning if you're dealing with just one atom and another type of atom and they bond, okay? But if you go into bigger ones, then you will need additional theory to, you know, understand how come this bonds this way and not. In the beginning, uh, especially for high school, it is good to start, okay, metal, non-metal. When they form, ionic compound. Why do they form an ionic compound? You go back again to that situation and say, look at the noble gases. They would like to create an octet, okay? So it will go into understanding later. Now, when you look at the octet, a lot of people would say eight electrons around it, okay? But normally, even especially when you go to organic chemistry, you will notice that the octet rule changes its uh, description, right? It's not really just having that eight electrons around it, but we're looking about stability because you will put in there the resonance, right? The resonance forms, right? Understanding the, the localization of electrons and things like those. And this is actually a graduation of theories from one extreme theory to another, and then they coalesce depending on how we will be able to make sense. So if you're asking, can we generalize that most atoms would want eight electrons in its outermost orbital, that is the octetrol. Yes, that's a good starting point, right? But if you start looking into the gray areas, then you have to incorporate other theories that may help you understand the physical properties. I always tell my students that 
this is the physical property. This is the manifestation of the chemistry of that material. What does the theory say about that? Why is this theory not consistent with what you are actually measuring? Okay. Of course, most of the time in high school, we don't deal with a lot of these deviations and anomalies, right? Because we have what is uh, set by the standard. And that is good, okay? But we should always be open to the idea if we put in a C that says, this is not black and white, and in the future, it will grow into something else. Because a lot of, a ch a lot of challenges that, um, say, university professors would meet would be the misconceptions the students would be bringing into their classroom, and that it always be a good opportunity to demystify them. It depends on your curriculum. It depends on the type of students that you have, okay? What would be the minimum requirement of your class? And that's why I will always be advocating for class differentiation, okay? When, when, they, when a student asked me before, hindi ka ba nagsasawa? Taon-taon na lang, nagtuturo ka niyan, and all that stuff. But you know, the moment you step in into a classroom, it's like a basketball game, as basketball players would say. It's a new game. You have a new set of students, right? A new mix. And the way they think will be different. And sometimes, um, not sometimes, but always, you learn a lot from your interaction with students, right? And then you would know how to treat the topic a little bit more differently depending on the, you know, the type of students that you have. I hope that helps in one way or another. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you, Pa. Actually, the... Uh... Merong palang follow up question with respect to that from YouTube by Ryan okay. Huang. So, how do we explain noble gases forming compounds, po? Well, noble gases, pwede mo yung it treat very simply with Coulomb's law. The fact that the way the noble gases are situated, if you notice, the noble gases that form compounds are the bigger ones. By Coulomb's law, the electrons on the outermost shell are far away from the influence of the nucleus. So that means that electron can be easily interacted with another species. Okay, so that's why we welcome the fact that xenon can form compounds and krypton can form compounds because they are bigger atoms and therefore their outermost electrons are of lesser influence from their nucleus. So that means they can donate that or they can share that with some something else. So that is the, the best situation that I can think of. And normally that's what I tell my students. Of course, if you go into advanced courses, you will know that there are a lot of reasons behind that. But at the minimum, you would know this, if, you, if the student understands the structure of the atom, right? And the placement by which we look into electrons, especially uh, giving credence to valence electrons, because bonding always happens with the valence electrons, right? So that is where it comes in. So they form compounds because the outermost electrons are far away from the nucleus, less influenced by it. So either they, normally they would share these. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Oo nga, uh, medyo intriguing nga kasi yung noble, kumpa, uh, noble gases pero may meron pa, may, nakakapag-form siya ng, ng compounds. So, yes, actually... Uh, the, yeah, so, sorry, Dang, to cut you off. Uh, I just want to add a little bit more. Kasi if we did not introduce Coulomb's law into our atomic structure, mahirap i-grasp yung concept na how come krypton and xenon are forming compounds when they are noble gases, right? If you understand the structure of the atom and you explain uh, the nuclear... Uh, the nuclear force that the nucleus does with the outermost electrons, then that makes sense later. Yes, sir. Okay, cool. So, meron pa po isa pang question si Ryan. Uh, with respect to the term IMF, I think you mentioned that earlier. Do you recommend mm -hmm. use of the term IMF to include ion-ion interaction? Um, in my class, I use the interunit force. Right, because this is another misleading. Uh, of course, in the textbooks, they will always say intermolecular force because this type of interaction is common among covalent 
molecular substances. But the moment you say you dissolve something in water, say uh, a salt, so it separates into ions. And what type of interaction is happening? It's an interunit force, right? So it's the electrostatic attraction between the cation and the water molecules. The water molecules are polar. So normally in my class, just to make sure, I call them the interunit forces, right? Because an ion dipole force is normally stronger than the common van der Waals forces, okay? And of course, depende rin kung saan ang gagaling. Uh, a lot of organic chemistry teachers, especially textbooks, uh, would refer to the dispersion force as a van der Waals force and the rest would be different. But if you're looking at a different perspective, we normally refer to them as van der Waals forces collectively, the interunit forces, right? And organic chemistry would always say H bonding and things like that. But, but you know, intermolecular force, if the interaction is happening between covalent molecular substances, but of course, if it's in an ion and um, a covalent compound, so, Generally, we just say interunit. And yeah, and a lot of students would, some teachers would also be teaching about directional and non directional bonding, but that is also another gray area that you can explore when you talk about, say, alloy. Okay, when you put carbon into iron and things like that. So uh, you can see a lot of other, you can learn a lot of things when you look into the bonding of solids, actually. Okay, sir. Thank you, Pop. Yeah. So, I think mahalaga nga na ma-quantify, ma-explain natin na mas magandang gamitin yung interunit uh, force. Yeah. And uh, that is a question from Flor de Les Agustin uh, from uh, Zoom. So, what virtual applications or online platforms can be used regarding the discussion of general chemistry topics, such as modeling, or organic compounds, same as chemical bonding. So siguro, sir, uh, nagre-request siya kung meron po kayong alam na virtual application or online platform that they can use to supplement yung general chemistry topics or organic compounds, uh, specifically yung chemical bonding sa organic compounds. Um, actually, probably the reason why feels I have is existing is to address such. For one, I'm a teacher who does not always tell my students to punta ka lang sa YouTube at maghanap ka. No. If you're a teacher, you have to look into the video first and see if it's consistent with what we normally teach. Because, well, we are in the information age and you can just log in. So unless you have call out all of those. So I'm very careful when suggesting, um, uh, say, websites to use. But, but of course, these websites would, would depend on the, the biases that the one is actually doing the video or the curriculum. So it would depend. Now, in class, I would suggest that uh, we use model. Certainly. Sorry. Okay. So models. And then we can use uh, yun nga yung mga online applications. So my, meron ng, ako, for me, I'm using the Mastering Organic Chemistry website for organic. And for general chemistry, I'm not sure if you have tumbled against the UC uh, website. Uh, have you seen the Libre text of the University of California? So it is actually a coalition of a lot of these university systems. So meron sila mga chip in ideas din. But this is a little advanced, but of course, when you do the actual reading and you go back, you will see a lot of items in there, right? Um, models will help, actual models. Of course, sometimes we, we have to spend money if not, if the companies or our school does not uh, have that. And yes, online, we can find a lot of information. But again, I'm very careful in uh, looking into it because there are a lot of those, okay? So say, for example, in my class right now, say, uh, unfortunately, say, a student of mine uh, catched COVID, and, but say, for example, asymptomatic. So he or she has to stay in, at home. And 
sometimes we do Zoom. So while I'm discussing, we can do that. But of course, face-to-face -face interaction is still different from online and because the uh, ped pedagogical basis will be different, right? So if you're doing an online class, it will be a little bit more challenging because you have to do a lot of manipulation on screen. So if you are, your peer students are learning from online materials, then make sure that you have looked into that. So maraming pwedeng kagunan, pero ang, ang issue ko dun is tama ba yung konsepto nung particular link na yun? Because some, sometimes it will always confuse or you confuse the student a little bit more. Yes, sir. Thank you po. Oo, oh, totoo yun. Ah, naranasan ko din yun sa mga classes ko. So, madaming information, pero kailangan mong i-vet yung accuracy ng mga information na makikita natin online. Diba? And uh, one thing for sure, yung mga materials na nasa fields I have, vetted yun. So, may accurate yung mga yun. <laughs> <laughs> sir, uh, meron po tayong question from Manolita White from YouTube, will a practical approach of science be more applicable to slow learners? In what way can practical science implement it? Well, that's a good question as a part of pedagogy. If you're a high school teacher, most likely the practical approach would be better. But of course, uh, it would be ideal depending on how large your class size is. Okay, if you're a seasoned teacher, especially in high school and elementary, you're doing a lot of differentiated instruction, meaning you have in your own uh, curriculum or what you call that? Anong tawag nila dun? Sa atin kasi class syllabus lang meron eh. Yung, basta yung, yung plan nila, lesson plan, yun. If you have a lesson plan, you actually have what? You have separate activities for the slow ones you have for the general audience, your class, and for the advanced ones. So while the others are already doing the algorithmic, compute na sila, the others might be looking into a manipulative approach if they cannot identify or visualize ito yung atom, nagbabani to this one. You can do a, you can find a YouTube maybe. Uh, material or an actual manipulative so they can have done it practically. And I'm not sure if our laboratories are really working in the Philippines now, especially now with pandemic, uh, using uh, chemistry lab is probably more daunting. Um, actually, when we did, uh, when pandemic hits, we uh, totally shifted to online except for our laboratories. Right, so our students come to class for their laboratory work. We did all the precautions, so that means we can only have as much as four, uh, four students in the laboratory at that time, right? Because of the distancing and all that stuff. But yes, a practical approach is good. Like, say for example, if it's a totally uh, lecture class, you can do a demonstration in class. Like, some students would not, you know, realize what precipitation is. Bring vinegar, bring milk, put it there. The curdling happens, the students see it happening before their eyes. So that's a practical approach to understanding what precipitation is. It depends on uh, what we have. We can always start from our kitchen, right? The kitchen is a good chemistry laboratory, really, right? But, you know, we, sh we should know the type of reactions we're dealing with. And the uh, magandang idea yan yung mga practical laboratory experiments na hindi mahal ang ingredients, right? You can always create experiments that they can do with, you know, household items. Yes, sir. Actually, medyo maaga pa, pero ipa-plug ko na, iba dun sa series of uh, webinars na meron tayo for the STEM Teaching Fellowship, one of those webinars, which will be given mm -hmm. by me and Marty and Chester, is about uh, designing lab uh, experiments. So magbibigay kami ng konting tips at saka konting examples ng mga practical lab experiments na pwede natin magawa. So sir, meron po okay. dito question. Uh, sa sandali lang. May, okay. ah, sige, May nakita lang ako dito, uh, uh, Ms. Raquel Bernal, she says competencies, most hmm. essential learning, 
competencies daily lesson plan. Yes, when we do that, you have an actual uh, test for the competency level. Like what I did here when I was preparing this material is what type of questions should I be asking to my students? Like that's why it was leading, right? But it, because if I just give them the table, and then you say account for the differences. That's a PhD type of question, right? So when I see show all the melting points in a table and I just say account for the differences, how will the student know what to compare in the onset? See, we build it layer by layer, horizontal relationships, vertical relationships, and then you go into bigger picture once you have broken down the idea. So, what competency will the student learn asking this particular question? And how do, I, how do I give that as an activity, how to reach that? So that is very much embedded in the lesson plan. So I hope that more and more of our teachers will see the difference between writing what a learning objective is and what a learning outcome is, because there's a large difference, right? So in the pedagogical aspect, that would be supposedly be addressed because we should be shifting more into the learning outcome type rather than the learning objective. Thank you. Yes, Dan. Yes, okay po yun, sir. Kasi minsan, uh, may tendency tayo na binigyan natin yung, yung buong table, tapos, oh, sige, explain mo na, kabuan na. So, dapat uh, hinihimay-himay natin para mas madali nilang maintindihan. And they, they will be able to come up with a generalization naman if if nahimay na natin ng mas maayos. So, yes, Sir si Clinton Imbong, uh, meron lang siyang mm -hmm. uh, statement na sinabi. So, this means that there is no orthodox concept about chemical bonding. So, tinatanong niya, tama ba daw siya? So, am I right? So, orthodox... Uh, ano, bang, ano ba ang definition ng orthodox? <laughs> For me kasi, when I uh, looked into a concept, Remember, especially when you're teaching general chemistry, what we are looking into in the beginning are the small stuff, the generalization that comes out of centuries and centuries of outputs, right? So there are deeper understanding into a particular concept, right? What we're doing is just the, we are merely scratching the surface. And that's your job as a teacher to peel the layer one moment at a time, right? Depending on the competency of the student and the timing of the class. So to answer that question, uh, really, when if you look into the physical universe, remember, physical theories are there to help us explain the physical phenomenon. And as a physical chemist, I would always tell my students that, look, this is the physical significance of this particular equation in this theory. You should always be appreciating that with respect to what you observe. Say, for example, the use of the van der Waals equation regarding gases. So you will see there a plot. Mathematically, it has importance, like a cubic equation. Pwedeng magkaroon ng negative value, yung value ng x if it's cubic. But does it have a physical significance if applied to volume, for example? Okay? In the physical sense. Negative volume, if we're talking about liquid. That's absurd, diba? So when you look at a particular theory, and you would say that meron bang orthodox. Now, let me say this. When you go to physics, for example, we are familiar with Stephen Hawking, right? And he is an advocate of the unified theory. And we don't have that yet, but in his vision, there is. Meaning we should be able to put together Einstein's theory of relativity and Newtonian physics, the classical one, classical, classical physics and quantum together. And this is the gray area. So when you teach chemistry, you're talking about atoms and molecules. It is in the sweet spot of the large rigid bodies and the small ones, particle physics, right? So importante yung rigid body, like yung mass, acceleration. Pero pagdating mo ng quarks, gluons, leptons, importante yung wave properties nila. See? So, sa ngayon, so when you look into physics, there's no unifying theory there that would put them all together, the classical and the quantum. They have a description of that. 
maybe in the future we'll be arriving at that. So when it comes to bonding, it's always a gray area for me. That means one theory is not enough to explain a particular type of bond. That's my take on that. Opo. Actually, Clinton clarified on ibig sabihin ng orthodox uh, single correct concept. So I think we, we can all agree na we, we cannot associate yeah. just a single concept for, for chemical yeah. bond. Okay. So actually, sir, that's uh, all for the questions that we have for uh, this morning. Thank so, you. Actually, madami na nga siya at magla-lunch time na. So before we <laughs> end, I give back the virtual stage to uh, JP to present our certificate of appreciation to Sir Monter. Uh, Thank you. Are you seeing the certificate, ma'am? Am I showing Hi, I'm sorry. Are we yeah. going to Sir Monter? I can see it. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I can see it from the screen. <laughs> Hold on a sec. Mm -hmm. uh, all before, right. Ah, uh, before yeah. I uh send the certificate, kasi na wala siya sa desktop ko. Ah, <laughs> uh, discuss ko po muna yung mga future events natin. Ah, okay, uh, okay, no problem. Uh, okay. So for June, we have uh, uh, I think three three events lined up. So the first one is uh, the introduction to uh, alkenes and reaction mechanisms. So ayun po. Nagtatanong po ang mga audience natin kanina ng mga quality content na webinars. So isa po ito dun sa mga yon And uh, Dr. Din D. Voiles from the Louisiana State University will discuss uh, the introduction to alkenes and reaction mechanisms along with uh, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bungkin. And uh, ayan, uh, trained din po sila sa uh, Institute of Chemistry sa UP Los Banos. So we can trust on the quality of this uh, lecture. So ayan po, that's going to be on uh, June 5 uh, at 10 a.m. And then after that, we have a uh, uh, green chemistry uh, webinar. So uh, you can see that uh, yung mga chemists po natin are really uh, very invested on this, uh, on this uh, endeavor to, to introduce chemistry to our audience. So we have uh, Professor Maria Catrina Vasquez de Paz from Adamson University. Uh, uh, discussing about green chemistry, its principles and in initiatives on June 19 uh, at 10 a.m. So yung mga uh, registration po for these events are already posted on our Facebook and also on our website. So kindly sign up for these if you are interested. And uh, on June 12, uh, Ma'am Daang, Ma'am Professor Joan May Aguila will be uh, delivering the uh, seventh and the penultimate course of uh, uh, Pills I Have Research University training course on thesis writing process. So, uh, ito na po yung uh, pang pito sa walo na course for research university. And we're nearing the, the end of the program. So, uh, kindly catch up po kung uh, medyo nahuhuli tayo. And uh, dahil malapit na po yung uh, uh, issuance natin ng completion certificates for, for that program. So, that's going to be uh, June 12th at 10 a.m. And uh, ayun, makita-kita po tayo doon. Wait. Let me just see if I can. Okay. And now I'm sharing. Uh, can you see it now? <laughs> Uh, or certificate of appreciation. So ito lang po yung mabibigay namin uh, for now for, for uh, Sir Raymond. Uh, we would like to present this uh, certificate of appreciation to uh, Professor uh, Raymond Monterey of the College Prep Center of Saudi Aramco for delivering the webinar Grayscale, Grayscale Approach to, Reason to Reasoning in General Chemistry, uh, Chemical Bondings in Solids, organized by the Filipino Science Hub and held via Zoom and YouTube on this day, on the 29th day of, uh, Ma of May, 2021. And this is signed by our um, Philsci Hub CEO and founder, Dr. Jeffrey Bunkin, and yours truly, uh, head of research, Philsci Hub Research University. So at this juncture, so uh, we would like to thank uh, Professor 
uh, Raymond Monterey, Hermon, maraming maraming salamat po. He actually uh, um, wake up very early for this uh, event. So magkapareho po kami ng time zone. So now it's uh, 6.30 a.m. and we started at 5. So uh, I hope our audience will recognize uh, Professor Mon uh, for his uh, efforts for this for this event. So sir, maraming maraming salamat po and we're uh, looking forward to to seeing you soon in one of our events. Thank you very much for having me. This is a good opportunity, you. actually. Thank you. JP, gusto mo ba mag uh, screenshot ng ah ng ano class picture? Oh, yeah, class picture, tama. Do that. Okay, so may we invite everyone to please turn on your video so we can take uh, screenshots. Si JP po ang mag, uh, ano, mag cue sa atin. Oh, mag cue. Oh, uh, wait. Just open my screen. Okay. So ready po tayo, ha? Ah? On three. Okay. One, two, three. Okay. Yung po yung first. And then, apat po yung ano, panels natin, ha? Ah, kaya... Ano, wag lang po tayong tumigil sa pagngiti. Maganda po sa katawan yan. Okay? One, two, three. The third. One, two, three. Last na po. One, two. Okay, thank you very much. Marami pong salamat sa nag-attend. Sana po nakatulong ako in the smallest possible way that I can have. Thank you. Thank you very much po. So, Thank you, sir. Marami pong salamat sa pag-attend. And next week, meron tayo ulit, no? Yes. Ah, so, every week na po ito. <laughs> Thank you po. Marami Thank you so much po. Uh, Na-post na po ba yung... Uh... Link for the uh, certificate. Let me just... Yes, pero okay. pwede ko naman siyang i- yeah. i-flood okay. ulit. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, uh, YouTube as well. I-post ko lang din po dito sa video description. So, uh, kung may mga kasama po tayo na hindi naka-attend po ng live session natin for this morning, they can always check the, the video description on YouTube for this event. And yung link po for the certificates uh, is on the uh, video description. So, kindly check it out. And ayun, maraming maraming salamat po. And uh, we hope to see you next week for uh, another webinar from the Phil's I Have Research University. Um, my name is JP Onya. And I'm, uh, we, are, we are joined today by uh, some of our members of our leadership team. Nadya po si Ma'am Michelle, si Ma Shelley, si Ma'am si Ma Analet, Sir Chester. So, ayan, maraming maraming salamat po and we'll see you next week. My name is JP Onya and on behalf of uh, uh, Ma'am Daang and all of us here at Phil's I Hub, maraming maraming salamat po and have a nice weekend everybody. Thank you.